Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good morning, Detroit. How are y'all doing? Alhamdulillah. It's uh, always a pleasure to, to be in Michigan, one of my favorite communities in the country. And a lot of reasons, obviously. Any community that gives the world Qahwa House, I think, is one that deserves to be celebrated and appreciated and often visited, alhamdulillah. So with regards to uh, the, the theme of this conference today, it's about Quranic principles, verses of the Quran that are overarching in their nature. And I'm very happy to be going over a beautiful verse from Surah At-Tawbah that is tied to a very painful episode of, in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu And the episode goes, it's the story of the repentance of a great companion of Rasulullah Sallallahu Ka'b ibn Malik. Ka'b was a companion from the Ansar. And he was someone who is of the earliest Muslims in Medina. And he tells his own story. What makes this story you know, very amazing and interesting is that, and unique is that Ka'ab is narrating this entire story himself. Years later, after he had become old and blind, and he is recounting events that happened decades ago. But the memories are still there. The emotions are still there and the interactions and the emotions that he felt from individuals and the way that people interacted with him are all presented in this beautiful and long hadith. And he tells of how he was present for every episode and event with Rasulullah every battle, except for the Battle of Badr. And he mentions why he wasn't there at Badr. As we know, Badr was not something that was an anticipated event. It wasn't supposed to be something that was expected to be a battle. And so the Prophet وسلم, and a band of 300 companions were going to intercept a raid. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manipulated the believers and the mushrikeen for the battle of Badr to happen. He maneuvered both camps for the battle to happen. So no one was blamed for not being there at Badr, Ka'ab says. But there was another campaign that he missed. And this one would be completely different. In the ninth year of the Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ was preparing to engage in a campaign against the Byzantine Empire. And because this was such a formidable foe, you're talking about a superpower, and because it was in a time of the summer where the heat was almost unbearable, and because it was at the time when the Ansar were harvesting and they were farmers, the battle was going to be and the campaign was going to be so arduous that it was called Jaysh al-Usra and the Prophet ﷺ started to do things that he never used to do. He never used to tell the companions who the actual enemy was going to be. And he wouldn't tell them which direction that they were going to eventually go in. All of this to ward off intelligence and to ward off spies. And yet this was going to be such a difficult campaign, such a challenging campaign that the Prophet ﷺ told them and he told them to get ready. And Ka'ab at that point in time was never wealthier than he was in those days. And so every day he would go out to the marketplace saying that he was going to get ready and every day he would come back not having accomplished anything. Procrastination, procrastination. And every time he would tell himself, I can catch up. I'll make it up tomorrow. I'll make it up the day after. I'll make it up the next day. I have the resources to be able to catch up. And every day he would come back having not accomplished what he wanted. Until the Muslims left. An army of 30,000 people went on to Tabuk. And every day Ka'b ibn Malik is saying to himself, I'm still going to catch up. I'm still going to catch up. I can you know, get a faster ride. I can, I'll make it. And every day he would come back having not accomplished anything. Eventually, Ka'ab looks around and he sees that the entire city is empty. Except, he says, of two people. Two categories of people. People who are excused, the elderly, the disabled, women, and, or children. Or people who were hypocrites and they were known to be hypocrites. And Ka'ab mentions, he says, there was no documentation being, there was no registry of soldiers, there was no one whose name was being recorded. And so Ka'ab said, I, I, I started to feel bad that I'm looking around in the city and I see that everybody around me are people whose company I don't want to be in. And the Prophet ﷺ arrives in Tabuk. 
And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although 30,000 companions are with them, he notices the absence of Ka'b ibn Malik. And he says, ma fa'ala Ka'b ibn Malik? What happened to Ka'b ibn Malik? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is amazing in his capacity and his ability to recognize the absence of people. You know, there are some people who, since last Ramadan, we haven't seen them in the masjid. And nobody's missed them yet. The only thing stopping them from coming back to the masjid was the fact that Nobody's sent them a call, no one sent them a text message saying, hey, sister, where you been? Come through. And so the Prophet says, Ka'b ibn Malik, what happened to him? And the companions debated it with regards to what happened to him, and the Prophet was silent. One companion spoke ill of him, and another defended him, Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And Ka'b ibn Malik is telling us this story because all of this news reached him. And he told us Mu'adh ibn Jabal defended him, and he remembered that decades later. And then there ended up being no campaign. The, the Byzantines or the Romans had left. And so the Prophet وسلم, stays in Tabuk for a number of days. He turns around and now he's on his way back. And Ka'b ibn Malik is panicking. He heard that Rasulullah and the army are on the way back. And so now, like what excuse are you going to make? I mean, have you ever spent a night where you were the next day going to be in the company of, or you're going to be standing rather in front of a, a judge? or in front of your parents, or in front of a boss, or in front of a teacher, and you're thinking to yourself, like, what can I say? How can I word it? What, what should I offer? And Ka'ab said, I spoke to every prudent member of my family, and they all told me the same thing. They said, make an excuse, and the Prophet ﷺ will seek istighfar for you, and the istighfar of Rasulullah is going to be better for you than, than anything else. Like, you'll be fine. Just make an excuse. The Prophet is so merciful and forgiving. He'll, make, he'll forgive you and he'll make istighfar for you. Ka'ab said, so I, I thought of an excuse. And then when the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina in the morning, all of those excuses vanished from my head. And I realized that only the truth will save me. And the Prophet ﷺ, his habit was that when he would come to the masjid, he would go and he would sit, he would pray two rak'ahs. When he would come back from a journey, he would go straight to the masjid, he would pray two rak'ahs, and then he would go to his family. But this time, he came, he prayed two rak'ahs, and he sat down immediately to listen to the excuses of everybody who did not participate. Because this was a campaign where every able-bodied person was individually obligated to participate. And so everybody who wasn't there, he needed to hear why they weren't there. And Ka'b ibn Malik said, I watched as 80 some odd hypocrites came and they sat in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they all made excuses. And every single one who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard an excuse from, he simply took the Pledge of Allegiance from them again and he made istighfar for them and they left scot-free. Ka'b is watching this. So what do you think he's going to do? Imagine when you see everybody getting off scot-free, not even a slap on the wrist. Ka'b ibn Malik says, I went, and when it was my turn to sit in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he smiled at me the smile of an angry person. And he said, ma khallafak? What kept you behind? Couldn't you afford a ride? And then Ka'ab said, ya Rasulullah, I can argue my way out of anything with anybody. And I have been given al-jadal. I've been given the gift of argumentation. But if I know that if I put forward an excuse right now to you to please you, Allah will be displeased with me and you will be displeased with me. But if I speak the truth to you right now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I hope will be pleased with me and I hope that you will be pleased with me. I have no excuse. I have never before had more money and more access to a ride. The Prophet sallallahu then looked at his companions and he said, "Amma hada faqad sadaq." As for this one, he has spoken the truth. What does that mean about everybody else? And he knew it, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "Amma hada faqad sadaq." This one has spoken the truth. So get up until Allah makes a decision about you. He doesn't get an answer. He says, "Get up until Allah makes a decision about you." Ka'ab ibn Malik leaves the masjid and he's immediately swarmed by his family. What are you doing? Why did you do that? It would have been enough if the Prophet ﷺ simply made istighfar for you. And he said, they continue to reproach me 
until I thought to myself, let me go back and retract my statement. And then he asked a question that would change his life. He said, did anybody else say what I said? They said yes. Two men. Out of the 80-something, there were two. Hilal ibn Umayyah and Murara ibn Rabi'a al-Amri. They mentioned two righteous men who participated in the battle of Badr. They were for me an uswa, he said. They were for me an example. They were people who I looked up to because he wasn't there at Badr. And he said, these two participated in the battle of Badr. And so I stayed to my, my initial resolve. There were two individuals who were righteous, truthful. So he said, you know what? Forget the 80. They're more in number. They're not being punished. I'm going to stick to these two. What was the conclusion? For 40 days, the Prophet ﷺ commanded nobody to speak to Ka'ab ibn Malik and his two companions. It was an exercise of social isolation, solitary confinement in open air. They were going out. Ka'ab ibn Malik would go out to the salah. He would say, Salaamu Alaikum to people. Nobody would even notice his existence. No one would respond to his salam. He would walk into the marketplace, speak to someone. Everybody would just ignore him. Day after day, night after night, he said his two companions reclined to staying at home. They didn't even want to go out anymore. They would just stay at home crying. And Ka'ab ibn Malik said, because I was younger than them, I would go out and I would go to the salah and I would see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and I would say assalamu alaykum to him and then I would look to see whether his lips responded saying wa alaykum assalam or not. And then I would go into salah and I would see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa glancing at me while I was in prayer and then when I would break my salah he would look away from me. For 40 days this happened and then on the 40th day he gets a message from the messenger of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa saying to him Allah, the Messenger of Allah has commanded that even your wife now be separate from you. The one person that he had. And Ka'ab ibn Malik, he says, should I divorce her or what? He says, no, don't divorce her, but just don't let her approach you. And so he sends her back to her family, and now it's just Ka'ab. Just him and Allah. And that lasted for another 10 days. After 50 days, the Prophet wasallam is spending the night with his wife, Um Salama. And in the night, he says to Um Salama, Ka'ab has been forgiven. Um Salama says, Ya Rasulullah, should I send out a messenger right now? And then the Prophet ﷺ says, no, the people aren't going to sleep. Wait until Fajr. Ka'ab ibn Malik, he says, I was praying Fajr that morning on the rooftop of one of my houses, one of his clan's houses. And I was sitting in the state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described in Surah At-Tawbah. وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا حَتَّى إِذَا ضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَظَنُّوا أَنْ لَا مَلْجَأَ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا إِلَيْهِ The three who had stayed behind. Or the, stay, the three whose affair was deferred. Until the entire earth became constricted for them. And their very souls became constricted for them. And they realized that they have no recourse, no one to save them except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That there is no one to save them from Allah except for Allah. ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ يَتُوبُوا Allah has accepted their repentance, that they may repent. Verily, Allah is tawab and rahim Ka'ab ibn Malik said, I was sitting in that state of constriction on the roof of my houses. And then I heard a voice cracking through the silence. Ya Ka'ab ibn Malik, abshir! Ka'ab ibn Malik rejoiced. He said, I didn't know where it came from. I just fell into sujood. And I realized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had brought relief for me. He jumps down from the roof. And all of a sudden he sees companions running from everywhere. He sees a man coming, running down the street and another man running on horseback. And another man, because he knew that he couldn't outrun a horse, what he did was he ran up a mountain and he yelled from the mountaintop, and that's the voice that he had heard on the rooftop. These companions were coming from everywhere to celebrate this man's rejoice, uh, this man's 
tawbah, and everyone was saying to him, congratulations on your tawbah. Ka'b ibn Malik goes straight to the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, and he says, I saw the Prophet sitting there, and Talha ibn Ubaidillah jumped up, and he ran to shake my hand. And he said, no one from the muhajireen got up except for Talha. لا أنساها لطلحة أبدا. I will never forget what Talha did. This small gesture of shaking a person's hand in a moment of their happiness might be something that they never forget for the rest of their life. He said, I will never forget what Talha did. And he said, I saw the Prophet ﷺ and he was beaming. And when the Prophet ﷺ was happy, he looked like a, a piece of the moon. He just looked so beautiful ﷺ. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, Abshir bi khayri yawmin mundu ma waladatka ummuk. He said, have glad tidings. Rejoice in the best day you've ever experienced since your mother gave birth to you. And that also teaches us something. Some people, if you catch them off the cuff and you say to them, what was the best day of your life? They might say to you the day they graduated. They might say the day they got married. They might say the day they got divorced. They might say the day they had their first child. But in any case, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us that the best day a person, of a person's life is a day in which your tawbah is accepted. That verse, however, continues in Surah at tawbah The story of Ka'b ibn Malik is summed up when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha alladheena aamanu, taqu allaha wa koonu ma'a sabiqeen. O you who believe, have taqwa of Allah and be in the company of the truthful. Ka'b ibn Malik was saved because when everybody else decided to lie, Ka'b ibn Malik decided to, to speak the truth. And when everyone else was punishing him for speaking the truth, he did not waver in his commitment to the truth. He was not upset. He was not bothered. I speak the truth and this is how you guys are treating me. He recognized that the truth and being connected to the truth was more valuable than anything else. And Ka'b ibn Malik told the Prophet وسلم, that. He said, Ya Rasulullah, إِنَّمَ اللَّهُ نَجَّانِي بِالصِّدْقِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved me because of my truthfulness. And so my commitment to you as part of my tawbah is that I speak the truth for the rest of my life. And Ka'ab, when he's telling this story and he had become old and blind, he says, I don't know anybody who is tested with regards to the truthfulness like myself. And I have not intended to lie ever in my life since I made that, prophet, that promise to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I hope that Allah will protect me for the remainder of my life. Decades of his life has gone and he has held on to this notion of truthfulness. Holding on to the truth. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says, Allah, ya amanu, Allah wa kunu ma'a O you who believe, have taqwa of Allah and be in the company of the truthful. There's two things inshallah ta'ala that I want to conclude with. Number one. Allah firstly mentions having taqwa of Allah. And what is taqwa of Allah? Taqwa of Allah is to do that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded and to stay away from that which Allah has prohibited. Talq ibn Habid, he, he was asked, what is taqwa? Because he says, إِذَا وَقَعْتِ fitan فَرُدُّهَا taqwa. He said, when fitna happens, then repel it with taqwa. And so his students said, well, what is taqwa? And he mentioned three things. He says, At-taqwa al-amalu biridwanillah, that you do that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Ala nurim min Allah, that it be based on guidance from Allah, light from Allah, the Quran and from the Sunnah. Seeking the reward of Allah. If I'm seeking the reward of Allah, that means that I'm not seeking the reward of anybody else. You know what that's called? That's called ikhlas. And part of truthfulness is that a person be sincere in what they do. The actions that we do, because that's the opposite of hypocrisy. That a person does that which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the intention of pleasing other than Allah for your own ego or for whatever reason. And so taqwa is to do that which Allah loves, obeying Allah and His Messenger, based on a guidance from Allah and His Messenger, seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. That is taqwa. And number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, be in the company of the truthful. The truthful are those who believe in Allah. 
The truthful are those who believe in Allah's Messenger. The truthful are those who follow guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us in a profound hadith. And I conclude with this. He says, إِنَّ الصِّدْقَ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْبِرْ Truthfulness leads to righteousness. And righteousness leads to paradise. If there's one action that if a person were to commit to, that would be the most transformative, change a person's circumstances, it would be to commit to truthfulness. Because if you decide to be truthful, I'm going to speak the truth, I'm never going to lie. When someone calls you and says, where are you at? Okay, here it goes. Who are you with? Here we go. Like either two things are going to happen. You're going to clean yourself up or you are going to become comfortable with people knowing who you really are. Because what allows for us to commit vices, and that's why the most common cover of sin is al-kadhib, lying. Because lying is the cloak of sin. It's that which covers up our indiscretions. And hence the Prophet sallallahu says, avoid al-kadhib, fa'inna al-kadhib yahdi ila al-fujur. He said, and beware of lying, because lying leads to evil, wickedness, transgression, and all of that leads to the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is the day. This is the day in which the truthful will be benefited by their truthfulness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the truthful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be resurrected amongst the truthful. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be gathered with the prophets and the martyrs and the righteous and the truthful. And what excellent companions are those.